we're moving into our last Q and A session now on what authors and publishers can do right now and in the near future. And we are going to hear from Kave Bazargan, who's the director of River Valley Technologies. We'll hear from Ulrich Fisher, a member of the LaTeX project, from John Hammersley, the founder of Overleaf. And the session will be moderated by Dayan Genev, the creator of R5 and member of the LaTeX ML group. And we're linking to bios in the chat. Thank you guys, I'm really looking forward to this. Thank you, Shamsi, for the introductions. Uh, we now have the very difficult task to provide short answers to technical questions, many of which have decades of history uh, and many of which have decades of future developments ahead of them. So I have preceded a couple of questions from previous sessions that were not answered. And maybe I can start with uh, a question to Ulrike, or I think she would be perfect to receive it which was from Matthew Tucker Simmons. And it's a technical question. In terms of LaTeX to HTML tools, uh, LaTeX email is Perl-based, whereas tech for ht uses the tech parser. I am curious if the LaTeX improvements that Frank Mittelbach is discussing will make it possible to get better output from tech for ht specifically. And <laughs> what, I already what the I answered the question already. Um, yes, tech for it could make use of the improvements we add to LaTeX because we add information about the structure and tech for ht needs the structure. And yes, if the maintainer wants, he can do it. Wonderful. Uh, I, I, missed, I missed the written answer, but I also <laughs> wanted to add some context in terms of uh, uh, just to tie our work together, the LaTeX team is in this wonderful position where any enhancement they add uh, influences any other system that is trying to do HTML conversion. And for example, the outtext improvement uh, that first arrived in Tech for HT, later arrived in LaTeX ML, and I think they will arrive in all of the other. There are actually about ten converters that can do HTML tra translations, um, starting with uh, Tralix, Lwarp, um, Plastic. And there's a long list after that uh, yeah. th that follows. So there's a rich ecosystem of tools and uh, whatever any in innovation that the LaTeX team brings forward for accessibility uh, benefits us all. Um, yes, um, we are not ignoring HTML. If someone would, wants it, it's fine. It's a good format for many purposes. We are working on PDF because PDF currently lacks uh, lots of features that are really needed for accessibility and PDFs has to be accessible too, not only for the STEM, but also for normal documents, for contracts, bank statements, or whatever you get as PDF has to be accessible too. And so we have to work on in this area. We shouldn't forget PDF. Thank you. Uh, there's a question for Kave, and maybe I can ask uh, also to expand on uh, the general topic of the session, which is uh, uh, what should authors and publishers, what can authors and publishers do this year already and what is coming in, in the year to come? But the question is from uh, Reza Rodaubi to Kave, and it's, would it not help if Archive had discussion forums for each paper where questions at different levels, layman, et cetera, can be asked and clarified by authors or community? And yeah, so I guess this is in the general accessibility realm of uh, what is around the paper and uh, where are the papers headed. And welcome, Kale. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, I, I'm not sure I can answer that on behalf of Argus. I'm not the right person to answer that. <clears throat> Generally, it is um, it is clearly a very good idea to have discussions around the paper. Um, and that's why we have now <clears throat> a, a sort of open peer reviews and post-publication peer reviews. It's always good to have that discussion. Um, I'm not sure which which part of it. There's so many so many points I can make there. Um, yeah, it's not really a question for me. I feel the the but but yes, it we 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 need 
discussion uh, around the paper after it's been published. Uh, one thing I would say is that it's best to have, the, when we have discussions, <clears throat> is to have these in an annot annotation form so that um, a person can select a piece of text, write uh, 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 a note, and that is attached to that piece of text rather than the traditional peer review where you have a, a PDF file and you, you say, you know, this line of this page. I would go further and I, I'd say that we should have peer, also we should have peer reviews being in a, in a granular structured form, sorry, granular annotation form on the content rather than the current almost uh, 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 universal, universal practice of the peer reviewer um, uh, uh, having to say which line of which page. Thank you very much. And actually, uh, this is also a very nice segue to John and uh, maybe with the eyes of uh, founder of Overleaf, uh, how does he see the accessible ecosystem around the paper and uh, where he sees Overleaf this year and next year? Yeah, thanks. I I, I like Frank's answer earlier when he was asked about sort of accessibility of LaTeX. And you made the point that you know, LaTeX is this fantastic structured form of the paper and it has challenges, but it has all the structure. And like, unfortunately, a lot of that gets lost in the processing. Um, and we're quite excited by the, the work that Frank mentioned, the tagging that's being launched hopefully in a few months time. Um, because I think if you are, if you do still have the source available, you can do, you can do lots of things with it. And, and obviously tech, LaTeX to, to HTML or XML um, has been of interest. Um, and I think the, the interesting thing from Overleaf's perspective is we have a wide, a, a, like a huge variety of users, like both in terms of you know, age and career development, like you have students who are literally just starting out, like learning what it is to write a sort of structured piece of work. And, and you have very experienced people who are, who are very used to the tools they've written. And with Overleaf, we always had to try and find this, this way to make it as available to as many people as possible. And we've generally tried to do that through, um, through integration. So, you know, you can use Git to, work in a local environment if you prefer. And, and because you can take the LaTeX source out, you can you, know, you can convert it to, to other systems. We looked at HTML like converters over the years, but we struggled to find one that did it automatically. Um, but I'm really enthusiastic for the work that, that's coming on making LaTeX itself like be able to be more accessible sort of out of the box almost, um, because I think that's something we'll be able to take and 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 help build in to to how Overleaf generates the um, generates the outputs that people need. Thank you for that. So I think we have a very solid LaTeX lineup in that regard here, uh, and I would encourage any, uh, the viewers to ask any of the LaTeX questions because this may be a wonderful time to do the, to do so. Um, let me see if I can. Uh, just mention there's a question by Neil Soifer in the chat, which is um, it's of his uh, favorite topic. When reading a paper, is there anything that would make math, math in particular, more accessible uh, to some who is hearing impaired? Or is math not a problem in this LATIC? Uh, I'm assuming he means that uh, the problem here. Um, So I don't know if Ulrike wants to say anything about math syntax and the accessibility in PDF. Um, math is still a problem because it will be better in PDF 2.0 or 2.0, um, but it isn't really very well supported currently by the PDF readers. Um, the best probably will be if we attach math or mathml as file into the PDF, 
And then reader extract this MassML and read it similar. It, it reads it in an HTML file, but this really needs pushing from the community. So there's readers and screen readers and the technology support this. I think Neil can would be able to say more about the support and the IT technology here. There are options, but there really is need to be work to be done, both on the latest side and on the other side. Well, I have a segue here, which is exactly connected to this for EPUB 3, where uh, MathML was technically supported for a very long time, but supporting actual EPUB readers, um, uh, consumers in browser-based ebook devices and uh, various others was lacking or lagging behind. And while it was supported nominally, it wasn't always guaranteed to be there. So uh, 2023 is a really good year because we have all this momentum from the LATIC team and there's momentum from browser vendors moving MathML forward that mm. we can expect probably a lot more math enhancements by 2024, by next year. So the, I think velocity is quite nice at the moment, uh, having uh, watched the space for a decade. Um, let's see, I think there was a answer by Charles about archive wanting to let third party vendors experiment more before archive adopts anything officially. And that I think there was a related question about alternative authoring formats, because of course, even though we are mostly focused on data here, uh, there's, um, of course, there's Microsoft Word. Uh, there's the Pretext project, which is trying to do XML-based authoring. There's a large community of people authoring in Markdown. Google Docs actually now has an academic adoption. So in this wider context, and I guess I can, again, ask Kavi and John, uh, in this wider context of many authoring platforms, how do you see publishers um, managing actually this uh, variety of tools? Do you think there's a space for standards uh, to, to aid or uh, publishers to lead? How, how do you see the next year developing? Um, right, I'll jump in here. <clears throat> uh, the, the, I think authors should be, should write in what they're comfortable with. Um, going back to one of the things that was, I remember, for example, Stacy's thought of, of, of Taylor and Francis, she talked several times about having things accessible early on. Um, and we've heard that several times. You don't want to do it late in the day. One of the things that, what, that I think we should do is rather than the, the uh, peer review being done on a, say, a PDF, and then that uh, th that paper or that uh, public, <clears throat> forgive me, the article being converted to some sort of structure, we can do it right at the start. It's not too much of a jump. So if someone submits a LaTeX file or Word file or, or Jupyter notebook, whatever, at that point, it should be the, the, the publisher should encourage or demand that the author somehow interactively makes that content structure. So you start off with, con with structured content in a format that we agree with. I mean, the most common format now is XML. It could be anything else. It could be a, a JSON. It could be LaTeX, a, a, a particular set of LaTeX. But I think if we, if we, uh, uh, structure things right at the beginning, and then we can make things accessible right at the beginning. It will add a lot of, it will make things faster. It'll make peer review so much simpler, um, and it'll make collaboration very, very simple. Um, and it, yeah, so I'll, I'll stop there. That's what I, I yeah. as well. I guess I get it. I, I I agree a lot with with the fact that authors I think should and and, and will you know, write in the in the format that they prefer. Um, I, I think there's two sides of this which I think are quite exciting at the minute. One is that I do think there is more of a a push to help authors create accessible content, like even if just from the point about like Twitter encouraging you to add alt. Descriptions, you know, like it's not strictly in publishing, but there is a bit more of a push to make more and more people aware that they should do this. Um, 
But the other one is is the flip side of it that someone mentioned earlier in in the AI summaries of research papers, in that you don't have to consume a research paper anymore in in the way the author wrote it or the way the publisher publishes it. Like there are lots of tools now which will take that paper and you know give you a summary of it. Like like Scholarly is a great tool for getting a summary of a paper to distill it down. And so I, I think there's a lot of optimism in in using some of these tools to to create more accessible versions of papers. And it still requires the authors to do as much as possible up front. But I'm hoping that AI can maybe plug the gaps or maybe help where where authors haven't, or where the publishing process has accidentally or or just through that process sort of lost some of the accessibility. So I think I'm an optimist in general. I very much resonate with your optimism here. My AI is my original interest to get involved with scientific documents. And um, Archive Labs now has a new early beta of ScienceCast where they are uh, trying out a beta of um, abstract uh, podcasts where they narrate out the abstracts. And I hope they'll soon look at math syntax as well, which is currently missing. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, interesting alternative media of uh, AI coming in and helping automatically. Uh, there is this good point that Frank also raised in the, in the panel session about uh, quality, and I think several of the other speakers also mentioned that quality needs to be guaranteed by the author if you really insist on high quality annotations. Uh, I wanted to harken back to that session and say that once we have enough author provided annotations, AI can step in and fill in the gap because that is what, what is missing currently. We're missing a large data set of annotated math formulas and scientific images. And there is hope that as these tools get better, we'll get better outputs. Um, there is an interesting small technical question from Abhishek Bagel about, is there an option to make LaTeX documents to accessible EPUB? And I would say there are many uh, options, but there is a fundamental problem, which is coverage. So uh, I like to say that the markdown subset of LaTeX, the standard Leslie Lamport LaTeX, uh, as uh, Frank referred to it, has been solved 10 years ago or even more. And there are 10 plus tools that will get you usable HTML from that, or you, you, you can map to EPUB. So Pandop, for example, is probably one of the most robust tools that can get you EPUB. LaTeX ML also has an EPUB output. Uh, the, the problem comes when you have very advanced packages or very unusual packages that are rare. And Archive is indeed the great stress, stress test of uh, arbitrary wild type LaTeX because it has uh, over 10,000 packages in use, uh, which, which is in contrast to most publishers who probably Kavi and John would know, uh, I think have only a handful of packages that they rely on for their submissions. Um, I know that ACM actually recently did this where they standardized uh, a handful of 10 or 20 packages for submissions so that they can ensure HTML output with quality. And yeah, maybe this is a good transition into uh, restrictions. Do you think the LATIC ecosystem should be restricted to guarantee accessibility and maybe again to OGK or do you plan to just keep improving the core LATIC engine until you, you can ensure all of CTAN is accessible or would you instead have a small core that you want to focus on? We want to make accessible as much as possible, but it will not be possible to make everything accessible, I don't think. But we will won't restrict LaTeX. If someone wants, like me, to write a package about chess, it should be able to write a package about chess, and even if it's not accessible. Yeah? So we should want to keep open. Yeah, but naturally, but um, I think one of the main problems naturally to get this more accessible is that uh, publishers are quite interested in stable systems. And so quite often use old and frozen tech systems and don't really develop. If you really want to make it more accessible, for example, they have to switch to Onikut engines like Blue Alatech which isn't current pos not possible on archive. And also that need to find workflows um, to allow for more development, not to freeze something to five years old tech systems. That will be a problem. If that they don't change, uh, they cannot benefit from the development. 
Right, that's a great point that uh, you, you would need. So contrary to what I said, rather than restricting, make sure that you have recurrent updates to benefit from the latest upgrades. Yes, and, I, and, and you need feedback and people must test it and they must have really to try it. If you don't try, you don't develop some things. Yeah, you have get a bit risky, <laughs> take some risks. That's right. I, I've heard from David from Archive that they're planning to roll out the newest Tech Life or Tech Life 2022, not the newest Tech Life, uh, uh, sometime soon coming up. So hopefully they they listen and uh, <laughs> find out a slightly slightly faster release schedule so that everybody can benefit. Uh, there's a question from David Lowry Duda, uh, which changes the topic a little. Uh, he's also aware of Pretext, an XML-oriented tool that will produce either HTML or LaTeX as output. Is this something that any of you have any experience with or opinions about? And uh, does any of you have experience or opinions about the Pretext tool chain? Otherwise, I can jump in and mention that uh, I know one of the Pretext developers, David Farmer, and it's a very noble effort of uh, starting with structured representations oriented for structured output. So it would be, in a sense, accessible by default. They're very restricted. Uh, you have to be, so I think it's targeting lecture notes and academic books. And if you're within that scope, uh, they give you a vocabulary where you would get accessible outputs per that vocabulary. But if you wanted to write a package about chess, you would still have to go on the LaTeX. You could not do pretext. Uh, I guess I can add very briefly on that. Yes, I, think, I think what we found just in general is that, that you know, it's, it's hard to ask an author to learn a, a whole new thing. Um, that they may be only going to use for a very specific situation. Um, it's one reason why Microsoft Word is so popular because you can do almost anything in Microsoft Word. I mean, it's not great for some things, but you, you know, it's familiar to people. And I think that's what you know with LaTeX, it's it is familiar to a lot of people now. And so I think one of the challenges with with tools that do restrict is that you're kind of saying to an author you. You can use this in some situations, but you've still got to know LaTeX for other situations, or you've still got to know Word for other situations. And so you're kind of saying to an author, you can't do all the things. You just have this one specific tool. And, and sometimes that can be great, but it is, it's, you've got to be aware that there is that barrier that you're adding to an author by, by sort of giving that restrictions. And I think that's where it's, you know, some... Some services have managed to do this. Like I would say a lot of blogs now use a version of you know, Markdown or, or HTML, which is sufficient for the website. And, and people are happy to do that because it gives them enough for their blog. Um, I'm not sure we quite got to that point yet for like what is the like what is the minimum needed for an academic paper that would enable people to sort of have a subset of um, a subset of LaTeX that, that was sufficient. So you're maybe, trying maybe. to balance the needs of sighted and accessible users mm -hmm. uh, or accessibility needing users without too much disruption. And that is a delicate uh, balance that you have to balance. Yeah. But can I just jump in? I feel yes, please. I feel this is not, we're, we're concentrating on LaTeX here and tech and sort of tech variants of tech. If I go back to what I was saying about <clears throat> making something structured right at the beginning, right at, at, at submission, at the submission stage, then people can use what they like and we can build tools around each of these, each of these uh, uh, um, uh, authoring systems. So, and I, I'd say, say XML, XML and MathML, which we discussed before, if we can have at submission, with some aids for uh, uh, the, the the submitting author to convert this into say an XML in the background, the author sees an HTML version of that and they say, yeah, this is this looks right and they submit. So we've got past that first stage of having to deal with say an old tech file or a new tech uh, system, et cetera. You know, it's it, it's just an idea because 
we're going for what we want to have is a document that is safe, that is accessible now, but also it's accessible 20 years in the future. This is why we can't say, oh, it's HTML. What comes after HTML? We don't know. So it needs to be a, a some sort of structured format. Again, I'll say XML because it's the forefront of my mind and it's the standard now. That can then be converted very easily into different, into different formats. In, in fact, most publishers for the last 20 years, they insist, they mandate that if they send something to be typeset to a typesetter, it's what they call XML first. They create the XML, they convert whatever it is to XML, LaTeX or, or, or Word or whatever. They press the button, PDF comes out, HTML comes out, EPUB comes out, Braille comes out, and, and audio comes out. So I feel we need one format uh, that everything goes into one format and comes out. And if it's structured, say XML, sorry to keep going on, that means in 20, 30 years' time, there is, we don't have to go back and have this discussion. How can we make everything accessible again? So much, everybody. Uh, we are at time, unfortunately. We knew we would not have enough time to talk about all the exciting things that we want to. Uh, I encourage everybody to post questions in the discussion boards or seek people out and start. Discussions. Let's not let the conversation end here.